Okay, our next speaker is Lauren Andlo from Princeton. Okay. Um, hi, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, today I'm going to be talking about how groups of cells coordinate their migration behavior using the Drosophila ovary as a model system. There we go. Um, so when cells migrate, they could migrate as individual cells, such as this mesenchymal cell or this amoeboid cell, or they could migrate as a cohesive group. When groups of cells migrate, it's important that they're able to communicate with one another and to coordinate their behavior so that migration can be productive. And how these cells communicate with one another is an open question, and that's what my work is focusing on. So as you've seen earlier, my model system is the ovary. This is what the ovaries look like and how they sit within the abdomen of the female. Each ovary is comprised of 15 to 20 ovarials, which have younger egg chambers at the anterior and older at the posterior. This is an enlarged view of a single ovarial, again with younger egg chambers at the anterior and older at the posterior. And this particular ovarial highlights the stages during which border cell migration happens. Below, I'm showing you the stages of border cell migration. Um, in order for the border cells to migrate, a subset of the cells within the epithelium of the egg chamber have to be specified as the border cells. Once the border cells are specified, these cells form a cluster, and this cluster of cells collectively detaches from the epithelium and migrates posteriorly within the egg chamber. As the border cells migrate, they are guided by guidance cues from the oocyte, and they complete their migration when they reach the border of the oocyte. Oh, I would like to go back. Um, what I wanted to say was that in order for these steps to happen, the border cells have to coordinate their behavior, and I'm interested in understanding how that coordination happens. So the main point that I want to drive home today is that uniform communication among the border cells is important for the border cells to coordinate their migration. And specifically, uniform signaling among the border cells is important for coordinating migration. The signaling pathway that I'm talking about today is the rickets signaling pathway. Rickets is known to be a G-protein coupled receptor, and the known ligand is bursicon. Based on data that I don't have time to show you today, I found that both rickets and uh, the ligand bursicon are required within the border cells for the border cells to migrate. So rickets signaling is utilized for communication within the border cells. I wanted to find out what would happen to border cell migration when I mutated rickets in the border cells. So I generated mosaic egg chambers that have wild type cells expressing GFP and mutant cells lacking GFP. Here is a wild type border cell cluster and you can see this border cell cluster has completed its migration. Below are two border cell clusters that contain some GFP negative rickets mutant cells. And when the border cell clusters contain border cells that are mutant for rickets, the clusters fail to complete their migration and instead remain at more interior regions of the egg chamber. I told you that the first step of border cell migration was specification of the border cells. And so I was curious as to whether rickets mutant border cells were specified appropriately. In order to answer this question, I looked at the border cell specification marker SLOBO. This wild type border cell cluster shows you that all of the border cells normally express the marker SLOBO. This border cell cluster below has two cells that are mutant for rickets, they lack GFP, and you can see these rickets mutant border cells still express SLOBO, saying that specification is still occurring normally. So, I was then interested as to whether rickets was affecting the coordination of detachment of the border cell cluster or whether it was coordinating the guidance of the cluster to the oocyte. And in order to address these questions, I utilized a live imaging approach to look at border cell migration as it's occurring in real time. This is one of my movies showing you what wild type border cell migration looks like. You're seeing a membrane marker here. and. You can see in wild type border cell migration, the cluster forms. It extends protrusions towards the oocyte, which, in, which indicates that it is guided, and it completely detaches from the epithelium. We see something very different when we disrupt rickets in the border cells. 
What we see here is that the border cell cluster still forms and it still extends protrusions to the oocyte, which means that guidance is not disrupted. However, as the clutch cluster is moving posteriorly, it remains attached to the epithelium by this very long and prominent cell tether. This tells us that detachment is affected when we disrupt rickets in the border cells. The interesting thing about the detachment phenotype is that we see that detachment is most strongly affected in mosaic mutant border cells. So when the cluster is entirely wild type or entirely mutant, the border cells are able to complete their migration often and detach. Below, this is a mosaic border cell cluster. This cell here is lacking GFP. And you can see that this border cell cluster is tied to the epithelium with a cellular tether. I quantified this defect. I looked at how often border cells were able to completely detach, how often they detached with individual cells left behind, and how often they remained tethered to the epithelium. And what I saw was that mosaic rickets mutant border cell clusters exhibited detachment defects much more significantly than the full mutant clusters did. Likewise, I also looked at the migration timing um, in mosaic border cell clusters. I looked at the stage at which border cell migration should have been completed, and I saw that mosaic mutant border cell clusters remained at more interior regions of the egg chamber 50% of the time as instead of completing their migration. So what this is telling us is that when rickets is uniformly expressed within the border cells, whether rickets is expressed in all of them or in none of them, the border cells are able to appropriately detach from the epithelium. When rickets is expressed in some of the border cells but not in others, the border cells have trouble detaching and they remain tethered to the epithelium. So we just talked about how signaling, uniform signaling within the border cell cluster is important for detachment of the border cells. This is the detachment phenotype that I just showed you, and what I noticed about it was that the cluster was still adhering to the epithelium. So I wanted to look at um, adhesion proteins and see how these adhesion proteins were contributing to the Ricketts phenotype. It has been known um, that E. cadherin is important for border cell migration and is expressed at high levels at the border cell border cell boundaries and at lower levels around the periphery of the border cell cluster. What I found when I disrupted rickets in the border cells was that E. cadherin was now redistributed so that it was expressed at higher levels around the periphery of the cluster. This is what it looks like. Um, above is control, below is my mosaic rickets mutants. This is showing you the E. cadherin, and here is a heat map of the E. cadherin expression. So you can see in the control border cell clusters, E. cadherin is very high at the border cell border cell interfaces, not so much around the periphery. In our Ricketts mosaics, E. cadherin is now high around the periphery of the cluster. I quantified how often I see larger portions of the periphery with mislocalized E. cadherin. And I saw that I see mislocalized e cadherin around the periphery most often in mosaic clusters, but not in full mutant clusters. Interestingly, what I see is that the e cadherin mislocalizes not just over the mutant cells, but also over the wild type cells. This tells us that the e cadherin mislocalization phenotype is dependent on the identity of the entire cluster as a whole as being mosaic, and is not dependent on the individual genotype of the cells. So the model that we have here is that when rickets is expressed uniformly in the border cells, it is rickets signaling is happening uniformly within the border cell cluster. Um, we expect that rickets signaling is affecting a GTPase or a PKA or s some other downstream signaling molecule that when it is uniformly active, the border cell cluster is able to effectively regulate the timing of its detachment and E. cadherin is appropriately localized. What we see when rickets is non-uniformly active is that the border cell cluster is no longer able to regulate the timing at which it detaches, and instead it remains tethered to the epithelium. We expect that the force of this tether is causing the redistribution of E. cadherin within the border cell cluster. So what I've shown you is that it is important for the border cells to have uniform communication in order to coordinate their ability to detach, and that one of the ways that they uniformly communicate with one another is through rickets signaling. 
With that, I would like to thank my graduate school advisor, Trudy Schupbach, who mentored me in this work, my current postdoc advisor, Steve DiNardo, um, our facilities, uh, funding, and all of you guys for listening and coming. Thank you. Is, uh, is Bursicon coming from the brain? Have you tested if you get the same phenotype? So I guess you wouldn't because the, the border cells would all receive you homogeneously, but do you know if it's coming from the brain or if there's a more local source? So we actually, we, we utilized RNAi expressing Bursicon or against Bursicon in the border cells themselves, and that's when we see a phenotype. Um, we don't see a phenotype otherwise. Have you looked at ECAN here in localization in the full rickets mutant? I'm curious. Yes, I have. Why and that um, might so it was a couple slides back, but um, it, it isn't mislocalized in the full mutant. Oh. Uh, it isn't significantly mislocalized. Do you see a stronger mutant phenotype depending on the position of the clone? I don't. Or on the number of cells yes. in the clone? Yes. So that is not, it isn't significant. However, when there are relatively even numbers of mutant cells and wild type cells, the phenotype appears to be stronger. I just want to know if uh, the cells that remain attached, are those always the wild type cells or is it always the mutant cells or is it? So that wasn't something that I quantified. That would be something that I'd have to look back at, but that's a really good question. Um, this is a follow up question. Do you know where the signal comes from to activate rickets? Um, the signal, like the ligand, the ligand, yeah. the ligand we think is coming from within the border cells themselves because when we knock down the ligand in the border cells, that's when we see a phenotype. Uh, do you quantify the number of the, the border cell? So it can be the most specification for the border cell. I didn't hear the first thing that you said, I'm sorry. So did you quantify the number of the border cell including detachment? The number of the border cells. The total border cells. Because you show the detachment, but in the other world, that could be, you know, the most specification for the border cell. We see the same number of border cells. Including in the, the mosaic clones and then also the... Detachment. Yes, yes. So, okay. Quick question. Hi, Lauren. Um, did you look at Hi. Um, localization of other um, apical polarity markers like... Um, I did. So we see that apical polarity proteins are disrupted. The weird thing is that apical polarity proteins are more severely disrupted in the full mutants than they are in mosaics. Hi. So I just have a question. Instead of trying with RNAi, I would try with overexpression to see if a mosaic would induce the same type of phenotype. Yeah. Well, so it, RNAi against no, rickets or no trying overexpression. Upregulate. Okay. To have a uh, mosaic with other So I don't know if that's possible right now. I, there'd have to be a UAS rickets, um, but that I don't know if that exists right now. But <laughs> that's a good question. Hi, um, I'm not a fly person, so this might be a stupid question. Yeah, uh, no, it's fine. You said that you see the tethering effect only when there is a mosaic. Yeah. Well. They're most significant in the mosaics. Uh, so uh, any idea how are the flies able to sense if it's a mosaic or not? Like what's happening mechanistically? I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> any idea? I mean, any mechanistic information as to how are the flies able to distinguish if it's a mosaic or not and respond uh, to the testing? Okay. I mean, we have a few ideas about what might be going on. Um, it's possible that the, that this is utilized for the cells to, to communicate something to one another. Um, it's possible that this signaling is making some cells more able to migrate than other cells, um, and that there's an uneven migration capacity. Um, that's probably the best answer I could give. <laughs> yeah. So if I have my border cell biology right, the, the tethering or kind of like stuck phenotype also happens when that feedback that makes a clean jack stat on off decision is also, yes. uh, you get the same kind of phenotype there. So yes. is there a relationship to the jack stat pathway <laughs> so, there? And, and, and is there still some, is there also some residual specification differences? So I don't think so because I counted the number of border cells that were specified and it was always seven to 10 border cells, which is the number that you would expect. And so I would expect that if there was a problem with jack stat signaling that there would be more border cells.
good things happen when you leave enough time for questions. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.